Carlisle Group, and Daniel Lippmann, co-author of The Politico Playbook. Thanks so much for joining us, David. Um, last week, you helped reopen the Washington Monument after three years of repair work. Why did you choose to fund this undertaking? And I heard you have a funny story about uh, former Interior Secretary Sally Jewell and you about the monument. Well, the Washington uh, Monument had its earthquake damage a number of years ago. And I talked to the head of the Park Service and said, how long is it going to take to fix it? And he said, it's going to take a long time. I have to get the money from Congress. So I said, look, I'll put up the money. And, just forget Congress. And he said, OK. And so he started to do that. But then Congress got upset that they weren't getting credit for doing something. So they said, could they put up some of the money? So they did. Um, <laughs> then when they had scaffolding on it, um, they said, would you like to go to the very top of the, of the Washington Monument, climb to the top on the scaffolding? I said, well, I'll, I'll try to see what I can get up there. And so we <laughs> went there. And uh, the Secretary of Interior then, Sally Jewell, said, uh, let's climb up, not take the elevator. And I said, well, you know, is there a defibrillator here? Because I don't know if I can really make it to the top. <laughs> but uh, we did get to the top. And it's a, it's a great uh, place. It's 555 and a half feet to the top. And it, the reason it's that tall is because the, the ancient Egyptians realized when you build an obelisk, if it's 10 times bigger than the base, it will fall over. So it's 55 feet, 555 and a half feet up. Um, it's now open again. And it's a great view. I recommend it highly to everybody. Um, it wasn't built for quite a while. It's a typical Washington project. George Washington died in 1799. This didn't get started really until 1840 or so, and it wasn't completed until 1888. So it took about 40 some years to get it built, and it took about many years after he died to get it done. But it's, it's there, and hopefully we'll be there in good shape for quite some time. Your philanthropy has benefited Americans in American kind of a unique way. You've bought a uh, 13th century Magna Carta for the National Archives. You helped restore Monticello. But you're kind of rare among philanthropists because there aren't that many wealthy people who are investing in our civic treasures. Why is it hard to get people uh, in that, with those resources, to actually do that? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I, did, I was an original signer of the Giving Pledge, and there's the biggest philanthropists in the United States who are part of it. But for some reason, the kind of thing that's, that I've been spending some of my time on it is not as appealing to some of those uh, individuals. Uh, it, it's not that difficult to raise or to get a billion dollars contributed to medical research or to education. Those are great causes, and I give a lot of my money, and most of my money actually goes to those causes. But things related to civic education, reminding people of our history and heritage, what I've called patriotic philanthropy, just doesn't seem to appeal to as many people as I would like. And the point of patriotic philanthropy is not to pat oneself on the back, but it's to get people to know more about the history of our country and the, the good and the bad. So when I did Monticello and helped them redo it, I insisted that the slave quarters be built out so people could know that for all of his good features, Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. And I think it's good that you know the past because, as it's been said, if you know the past, you're less likely to repeat it in the future and not likely to make as many mistakes. It is a sad situation that today, 10% of college graduates will say that Judge Judy is a member of the United States Supreme Court, <laughs> which is not yet the case. And, um, and it's unbelievable that more high school sophomores can name the first three names of the three stooges and the first three names of any founding fathers. And three quarters of Americans can't even tell you the three branches of government. In fact, one third of Americans cannot even name one branch of government. And this is the most amazing thing. If you are a citizen, uh, if, this, if you're a foreign born citizen, and you are a foreign born uh, person in this country, and you want to be a citizen, you take a citizenship test. It has 100 questions. You pass 60 of them, you, you become a citizen. 91% of the people who take that test pass, 91%. Presumably, they've studied for it. A, a test was given through the Woodrow Wilson Foundation to um, citizens in all uh, 50 states, native-born citizens. And in 49 out of 50 states, a majority of the citizens could not pass the basic citizenship test that people have to take if they want to become a citizen. The only state where the, a majority passed was uh, in Vermont. Do you see any progress in getting uh, Americans to uh, more interested in civic education and kind of trying to reverse that tide? Or? Well, what's happened in recent years is that Americans have been obsessed with STEM education. And there's nothing wrong with STEM education, but we have therefore shortchanged civics education. We don't actually teach civics as much as we used to in junior high school and high school. We also don't, don't teach American history very much. You can graduate from any college in the United States without having taken an American history course. And 
and you can graduate as a history major from 80% of the colleges in this country without having to take an American history course. So people just don't know as much about it. And it's sad when you go to other countries that you, you find that they know more about our history than we do. So I, I, I don't want to say it's going to solve all problems. You know, it's not going to cure cancer. It's not going to eliminate income inequality. But I think it would be a good thing if we had better civic education. People learn more about the way our government operates and the way our history has unfolded. And the theory is if you have more informed citizens, maybe you'll have a better government. Do you think that's affected the more recent you know, populist? You can applaud. Right. Well. Do you think that's affected how Americans are, you know, they're kind of more believing in some conspiracy theories and they are more populist? And uh, People like conspiracy theories because it's, they're always interesting if they're true. And maybe, maybe there are UFOs. I don't really know. <laughs> but um, I, I think when you have the kind of, uh, let's say, take the Washington Monument. What's the value of fixing the Washington Monument? What's the value of, of having the Magna Carta be seen by people? It turns out that the human brain is still not yet so um, evolved that, if evolved is the right verb, that, that if you see the original Magna Carta, you're going to see it in the same way as if you see it on a computer screen. In other words, if you go see the original Magna Carta, you might, before you go there, learn more about it because you're going to see the original. Or after you see the original, you might learn more about it. And you might learn what the rights are and the kind of things in the Magna Carta that led to the Declaration of Independence. And, and therefore, I think until the human brain treats something on a computer screen the same as it treats the original, preserving the original so people can see them and get more excited about them and learn more about it is probably a reasonable thing to do. Um, in DC, you're known for hosting these bipartisan yes. dinners at the Library of Congress where you bring a prominent historian, you interview him on stage, uh, trying to bring, with members of Congress, trying to bring them together. But it feels like thing, you know, they're farther apart than ever. So how's it going? Well, let me explain what uh, I'm trying to do. And I don't want to say I can solve all problems in Washington, D.C. That's uh, you know, beyond my capabilities. <laughs> but uh, what I, I wanted to educate members of Congress about American history on the theory that they should know more about American history because they're the men making the laws. So about six years ago, I started a program where once a month, I get a great American historian, Doris Kearns Goodwin, David McCullough, um, people like that. And I interview them at a dinner that I host at the Library of Congress. And the members like the interviews. And I ask them to sit together, Democrats and Republicans, because they rarely are allowed to do that or do that socially in Washington. And I ask people from the House to sit with people from the Senate, because there are no conference committees anymore, because there's no legislation to speak of. And therefore, they rarely know people from the other House. And it, I wouldn't say that, that the era of good feelings has broken out in Washington, DC. But members say, rightly or wrongly, this is the, one of the most interesting things they're doing in Washington, which maybe that's a sad commentary on what's going on in Washington. But um, I, it does work. And I have a book coming out in um, a couple of weeks that describes some of the best of those interviews, including you know, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Robert Caro, and so forth. And one that I'll just mention is I, I added one person, the Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, I didn't think many members of Congress knew him that well. And as a chairman of the Smithsonian, I work with him a lot. So I've gotten to know him. And I interviewed him. And I said to him, did you um, always want to be Chief Justice of the United States? He said, no. Did you always want to be a Justice of the United States? No. Did you want to be a judge? No. Did you want to be a lawyer? No. Well, what did you want to be? He said, I only wanted to be a historian of American history. That's all I cared about. My father said, John, you'll never make any money. Historians write books nobody read. You'll starve to death. You sure you want to do this? He said, that's what I want to do. So he went to Harvard, major in history. Came back from spring break one day, gets in a cab, um, said to the cab driver, please take me to Harvard. And the cab driver said, are you a student at Harvard? Yes, I am. What are you majoring in? Cab driver, uh, and he said, I'm majoring in history. The cab driver said, when I went to Harvard, that's what I majored in as well. So um, <laughs> I think he changed his major, but anyway. <laughs> um, you know, talking about current events these days, if you go to the heartland and you talk to the average American, you're going to get a lot of skepticism and maybe downright hostility about free trade. How do people in this room and politicians back in Washington, how do they kind of knit together a cogent case for why trade is important to American prosperity? Well, remember, we were 5% of the world's population. We're about 18 or 19% of the world's GDP. Uh, with 5% of the world's population, but without a lot of the natural resources or other things that we buy from other places, if we didn't have trade with others in kind of a free trade basis, we would have paid much, a lot more for the goods we have if we can get the goods and, or if we could manufacture them. So I think there's no doubt in my mind that free trade, when it's done appropriately and there aren't things that are uh, interfering with the system, free trade does work, and it has worked for several hundred years. And the United States has benefited from it, unfortunately, uh, globalization or free trade is seen by many people who have probably 
less of an economic lifestyle than they would prefer, um, think it's, it's been disadvantaged, it's disadvantageous to them. And there's no doubt that some people have been left behind. But I think in the end, the United States has benefited from it, but we have to do a better job of explaining to people how they have benefited from it and why we'd be better, we'd be worse off if we didn't have an effective free trade system. But we haven't done a very good job of explaining that. And, and I'm part of the problem. I haven't probably explained it to people as well as I should. Um, and, you know, if you look at the warning, there are a number of warning signs flashing around the global economy, slower growth in Germany. Uh, what, but there are also anti Cassandras among us who say that we're in a bull market uh, and that Trump is going to keep us all employed with bonuses forever. What, um, you know, what, do you, what keeps you up at night in terms of... At my age, uh, many things keep you up at night. <laughs> but I would say um, I do worry about a recession, as everybody does. Uh, we, we have recessions on average every, every seven years since World War II. Uh, we're now 10 years without a recession. So at some point in my lifetime, there will be another recession, assuming I live a reasonable lifespan. I don't know when that will be, but the reason there's so much focus on it now is that the economies around the world are slowing down. They're not slowing down to the recession point, at least not in the United States, but they're slowing down. But in addition, we're having, we have a presidential election coming up. And history shows that when a president is running for re-election during a time of recession, he's not likely to get reelected. So my former boss, Jimmy Carter, didn't get reelected. Gerald Ford didn't get reelected. George Herbert Walker Bush didn't get reelected. It's been not, no president's been reelected in a recession since William McKinley in 1900. So it's a long time away. So people are obsessed with it, in part because they realize if there is a recession, probably there's a reasonable chance that the election will go different than the incumbent wants. But I, I, right now, I don't see a sign of a recession uh, I think the economy slowed down a bit, but I have to remind people, I, hate to, I shouldn't use the, that, that word because um, when I was in the Carter White House, Fred Kahn, the Carter's inflation advisor, kept saying, we're going into a recession, we're going into a recession, and Carter hauled them into the Oval Office and said, don't use the R word because I'm running for re-election, I don't want to scare people. And so Fred Kahn said, well, I have to be honest, so he said, just be honest, Carter said, but don't use the R word. So from then on, uh, Fred Kahn would say, I think we're heading into a banana. And he used the word banana as a substitute, so because reporters wouldn't put in a headline, Carter's inflation advisor thinks we're heading into a banana. So I don't know if we're heading into a banana, but it's slowing down. And if there is a recession, uh, this is, will affect, of course, the presidential election, but how do you think history might judge President Trump uh, and the era we're living in uh, since you're a patron of history? You know, I interviewed Ruth Bader Ginsburg the other night at the 92nd Street Y, and when she was getting married, uh, her prospective mother-in-law said, let me give you some advice about how to have a successful marriage. And it's very simple. Um, pretend you're deaf a few times. <laughs> In other words, occasionally don't listen to the question you might be asked or what your husband is saying. So I couldn't hear that question. No. <laughs> I was saying, uh, how do you think history will judge <laughs> President Trump and this era we're all living in? In our country, rightly or wrongly, presidents are judged to some extent in their success on whether they're reelected. So um, it's an unfortunate situation, but if you, George Herbert Walker Bush was, in my view, a spectacular president, helped with the unific unification of Germany, uh, led to the uh, getting Iraq uh, out of Kuwait and did many other things, but there was a perception, not accurate, that we were in a recession when he was running for re-election, and he lost the election. So he was not considered at the time as successful a president as, he, as, if, as if he had been re-elected. So President Trump will be judged as successful, if more successful, if he's re-elected. If he's not re-elected, then I think the presidency will probably have people coming out of the woodwork saying it wasn't a successful presidency. Jimmy Carter, in my view, did spectacular things as president, but because he didn't get re-elected, his presidency is not considered as successful as I think it should have been. The, you also have a very popular TV interview show uh, on, uh, that many people watch. Uh, I'll ask for my review later, but how, how do you approach an interview to make it rewarding for viewers when there's so much to watch and you know, they, have a, they only have a limited amount of free time? Well, I wear colorful socks. Uh, just like <laughs> No, uh, what I try to do is I, I am not a journalist. You're a journalist, so you're, you're on a mission, different mission. I try to get people who I know reasonably well, and I try to say I'm not trying to make you say something you don't want to say, not that journalists do that, but, and I don't want to embarrass you, not that journalists do that, but I'm trying to 
calm them down, and let them talk about what made their life work the way it worked. So how they come from generally modest circumstances to become successful and, and help change the world in whatever area they like. And I try to mix some humor into it because I think people respond with that reason well. So it's worked better than I thought. When I was first approached about it, um, the people at Bloomberg said, um, we're going to call it the David Rubenstein Show. And I said, a long Jewish name like that is not probably going to work on the show. And they said, no, at Bloomberg, we don't think that's a problem. So, um, <laughs> so it's worked out OK, and I enjoy it. And now we're increasing it from twice, uh, once every two weeks to once a week. And I've interviewed you know, Oprah Winfrey and, and, and President Bush, President Clinton, many interesting people. And um, you know, when I interviewed Oprah Winfrey, I said to her, look, you have a, a future in, in, in television, I think. She's really good. And I, I, a lot of these people are great, but most, many people come from very modest circumstances, and they tell you their story about how they overcame poverty or overcame a physical ailment or overcame a, uh, an emotional problem. And it's actually quite heartwarming to hear how these people explain how their life turned out reasonably good. I'll ask one final question before we get the hook. But what, from your background and you know, how you uh, you know, rose to where you are, right. can people take away when they're trying to be successful in their own careers? I, I divide life into three parts. The first third, second third, and third third. Um, generally, if you're very great in the first third, you're president of student government, you're a Rhodes Scholar, you're a Supreme Court clerk, White House fellow, um, you have the advantage to coast the rest of your life. The rest of your life you can say, I was president of the Harvard Law Review, I was a Supreme Court clerk, I was a Rhodes Scholar. The problem is, if you do that, you might not, in the second and third third, get the benefits of having a prepare for a successful career or get the financial or other psychological benefits of, of big success in your latter third. So the people who are often very successful, and I would put myself in that category, are people who weren't successful in the beginning. I wasn't a great athlete. I wasn't a student leader. I wasn't you know, great at anything. And so I just worked harder and harder and to prove myself and took you know, um, an opportunity to kind of learn how to to speak, learn how to read, learn how to improve the skills I didn't really have in the first third. But I had an advantage. I came from a modest background. My parents were not high school or college graduates, and I was their only child. But they, had, they gave me unconditional love and support. So everything I wanted to do, they would be supportive of it. And they didn't have any money. And when you grow up in a family where you have um, unconditional love of your parents and you don't have any money, you know you're going to have to do something on your own to, if you're going to be successful in life. If you grow up in a wealthy family, as my children have, it's a bit of a disadvantage. So all of you know if you're wealthy, and presumably if you're in this audience you're reasonably wealthy, raising children is not easy, particularly if you have wealth. Jackie Kennedy famously, famously said, if you mess up raising your children, nothing else matters in life. And maybe she was right. But she recognized that if you have children that come from affluent circumstances, it's difficult to raise them. So I had the advantage of coming from uh, modest circumstances and knowing that if I had to do anything in life and get anywhere in the second and third thirds of my life, it would have to be largely on my own and not my parents uh, opening doors for me. So that was an advantage. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.